Okay, I think that we're recording. <laughs> uh, can you hear me, Gary? I, I hear you very, very well. Very, very well. It's 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 me, Willem Dafoe, and I don't typically do this kind of thing. I don't know if you do either, but this is this is the first for me, really. I mean, I've done this show before, but the first was someone who's wearing exactly what I'm wearing. <laughs> you know, I didn't notice that. It, 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 right down to the blue shirt. We really are. Well, it, so, it, we're cut from the same cloth. That I would say that's probably the truth. Now, I just want to ask you a few preliminary questions okay, sure, 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 from my sure. files. Um, where'd you grow up? Where I'm sitting right now. Well, not literally, but I, in Iowa. And, and that's where I'm coming from right now. I, I left my career in your business years ago, 18 years ago, and now I, uh, I came back to the town that I grew up in, Waterloo, Iowa. And what is life like in Waterloo? That, I mean, that, what's a, a very, typical day? What's a uh, typical day for you in Waterloo? Well, you know, I get up, I, I, I milk the cows. No, no. <laughs> it, it's really not that different from probably your day in terms of I get up, I have breakfast, we have all the same amenities. I'm being defensive now, aren't I, Willem? I well, am. I'm being defensive because people but, assume that I'm in the middle of nowhere. But that's not that's not what I'm trying to do. I just I want to pay, paint a picture for the people what it's like to be in Iowa because a lot of people are on the east coast or the west coast so they don't know. But but typically it's is it is it is it is it different? Like in the sense that it's a different feel. Well, uh, it gets a little colder probably. It, the only real difference is a different time zone for the most part. I mean, and I'm not I'm being flippant here just sort of, but in truth, it's the same day. We eat the same food, we go to jobs. You yeah. know, it's not a it's not a, a a show business capital by any stretch of the imagination. Let's let's talk about show business because you were on Saturday Night Live I for was, 3 Jeff. years. Thank you but, for doing the research, cause, uh, uh, Willem. Thank you, Willem. Thank you, well, Willem. Thank but, you for doing the research, because I know you didn't know that. <laughs> Don't lie to me. Don't lie. Well, I have to admit, I didn't do all of the research, but I did do most of it. And I know that you were on there when Lorne Michaels had his hiatus, so your boss was Dick Ebersol. Is that is that correct. Right? I mean, yes. What was it like working for Dick Ebersol? Uh, it was like working with the George Steinbrenner of comedy. I don't think that he truly understood what worked or what was funny, but he knew people who did, so he sort of hired them. And, and, and give me a sense of, of what it was when you got hired, what it felt like, what where you were, what you were thinking, what was... <laughs> I, I was... Through. I was doing theater next door to Second City, actually, the Practical Theater Company with Julia Louis-Dreyfus, Brad Hall, who names that you surely know, Julia, for sure. And we were doing a show getting, you know, just local attention in Chicago next door to Second City. And then one day after a Saturday show, we were told that Dick Ebersol, Bob Tischler were there and they wanted to talk to us. So we went to their hotel, the Hilton Hotel, the next day, and they said, can you be in New York in a week? So when you're 22 years old and you're trying to get a Steak and Shake commercial, so that you can put gas in your car. Uh, I remember driving down Lakeshore Drive to what would be our last show with Julia Louis-Dreyfus, and it felt like winning the lottery. It felt like getting a winning lottery ticket. It felt like, you know, lightning struck a, a, a one in 10 million chance. It was exciting until actually getting there. <laughs> because it, it really is. It's like you're told you're an astronaut, but then you've got to fly the rocket. Right. I'm, I heard that from uh, Dom DeLuise, who wasn't on the show, but he had insight. Um, you were also in that Christmas show sketch, which I remember very vividly. You do. You remember. With, Actually, with Julia, and you would make out at the end. Yeah, it of, was of Gumby's this. Christmas special. And I am Donny Osmond, and she's Marie, and we're singing... Um, I'll be so blue Christmas without you. And we'd get closer and closer and closer, and then we would start to make out. It was a low-concept premise. It was an incest joke. Uh, um, Eddie Murphy ad-libbed as Gumby. I guess that's what it means to go Hawaiian. I don't know what that <laughs> means, but everybody <laughs> laughed. And so in the Saturday Night Live tradition... We did it again the next week, or or a few weeks later, as a Irish, uh, as a St. Patrick's Day special, singing an Irish song, and then we start to make out again. Then we did it in Saturday Night Live tradition a third time, and this time she comes out and she's pregnant. 
So yeah. it's taking one joke, that one joke being isn't incest funny, about as far as you can go. Well, I mean, and this is this is society, isn't it? I mean, we yes. take it, we get to a certain point, and then we try to get to another point, and then there seems to be, after that, no real point. But we continue to point. Right, and until we get there, we choke the life out of what we have. Pretty much. Now, I think you might be a little hot on the mic. Oh, <clears throat> you might just just be a little See, hot do, on the mic. I, I do that, Willem, because I get excited well, and then I, I get a little hot. Is this good? No, it sounds it sounds fine. Actually, it sounds it sounds. Really <laughs> hey, I good. got a question for you, and I know this has been asked ad nauseum. Of course, it has. But what is what is with Willem as opposed to William? Were your, why didn't your parents, you know, take out more vowels? Well, the joke is that they were naming me on the way to the um, the the, uh, the hospital, so they, they they didn't have time to write down. Well, they wrote it phon phonetically, and it just looked better like that. So they, you know, with the time pressure of trying to get to the of hospital, course. and just my mother was a shorthand freak, so she just put it together and that's what it was and i like it much better actually well, it, it, it's memorable and defoe is what is that defoe defoe it's not irish it's not what is defoe it's roman catholic uh, irish it's also um a, a jesuit aha uh -huh. i see so it, it has accents of autumn but also the colors of fall <laughs> <laughs> i hope that makes sense it, it makes none at all but uh, but it's a good answer all right so back you, to me Let's get back to you, because I want to talk about these three years. What was it these years on SNL for you? Because I know that you probably were taking a lot of heat, although all casts of Saturday Night Live take heat. They take heat now. The, every year says the show is done. Everyone says it's the worst season ever every season. So, <laughs> right. But for you guys, you were in a different atmosphere, but you yes. didn't know it because, no. because it was your first uh, – you weren't there before and you weren't there after. So – it was a slice of time that you that you had and I just want to know what what was that what was that that define did it define what did it, what did it define well it, that's an excellent observation as only you could make because the show is the same in terms of the audience's perception they're not sitting here thinking um, oh they're not really conscious of new producers and things like that. They're not really thinking. It's Saturday Night Live. It's on it on Saturday night, and it's live. And they, they know that the cast changes and things like that. And the format was the same. The process was the same of meeting the host, writing the sketches, reading them all, putting them on the floor. So, And the crew is exactly the same as from 1975 on. And so those elements were enough to inform us that, hey, we're on Saturday Night Live. And people on the streets, Saturday Night Live, hey, Saturday Night Live. It, 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 it felt like being on Saturday Night Live. Now, that being said, for someone like me, a neophyte from Iowa, um, not shy, but intimidated, Dick Ebersol was not Lorne Michaels in the sense of hiring someone for a reason and then bringing them along. So I was a fish out of water fighting for every table scrap. And that was true of pretty much everybody except Eddie Murphy and Joe Piscopo. And so I just, you know, I idolized them. I wished that I could be in their wake. Um, I had my moments. But ultimately, Saturday Night Live is a, is a collection of if there are ten things that happen to you, one of them is great and nine are really crappy. You know, that was every week. So I'd have my little morsel, but then I would also have reason to throw chairs. It's like that. It, it's almost the, the the problem of swimming in a big swimming pool because you've got to go to the end of the swimming pool, otherwise, you can't get out of the deep end. <laughs> right. But right. but being in a small little a wade little you know those tiny little pools that you put in the backyard, that's not fun either because you're not covered in water and and so for you, I mean, my biggest question is. Was Joe Piscopo working out back then? <laughs> because he certainly got a lot bigger. As... That all happened post Saturday Night Live. And Joe's a friend. Uh, I have a podcast. I want Joe to come on. So I, I'm very careful. I admire Joe probably more than anybody because he worked harder than anybody. But he worked hard mentally, not physically working out. He really captured his imitations and things like that very, very well. Uh, he deserved the uh, accolades that he got. 
But he didn't become Eddie Murphy, his best friend at the time, maybe still. And Eddie's Murph, Eddie Murphy's career skyrocketed. And so Joe was reluctant to do things in a traditional way so as not to be compared with Eddie. And I think that's why he then became the world's strongest comic uh, slash drummer in the world. He was looking for a niche that was his own, and he turned to bodybuilding. Um, you know, it's, I, I again, couldn't make I it much more clear than that. that I mean, that's I don't how think, I see it. I mean, the analogies are, you know, I mean, I could, I could also say that it was like being on a professional football team, and then you had to create your own professional football team after. Right. Because and Joe tried to make himself the entire team. I mean, he, he really got big. I want to ask you some more preliminary questions from my files, if you don't uh, mind. Where do you keep the files, by the way, Willem? Do you have I keep files? Them, I keep them in a briefcase. <laughs> you see, you keep them in a briefcase. I'm investigating the disappearance of Dick Ebersole. Interesting. Interesting. And may I just say this about you, Willem, and I mean this, I hope you take it in the way. You're a very handsome man in a sort of reptilian way. You know what uh, I mean? Well, that sounds, that sounds like a put down. Well, it isn't a put down because you, 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 you know that you're, you're, you've got some odd characteristics. But I am saying you're a very handsome man. You're a very handsome man. Well, from I appreciate, most angles. I appreciate that, but next time, don't use the word reptilian. Reptilian? <laughs> okay, okay. That'll, that'll throw anybody off. Okay, all right. In a, in a, a, a non-traditional non, you know, no. non way, you're very Listen, handsome. It looks like I'm wearing a suit. It looks like I'm wearing a suit on my face, but I'm not. Yeah. It's just <laughs> what it is. It's my normal face. If you saw my parents, you would understand. I, I'm sure they had something to do with it. And again, it's all uh, it's a package that makes sense. Willem, you, you're kind of the Willem to William the way you are to handsome. Handsome, but something's a little different. All right, we'll move on. I'm not handsome. I'm Hanson. You know what I mean? Okay. I mean it's, it's a shift in letters. It's almost it's listen. I just I just want to ask you a few more questions, if you don't mind. Sure. sure. No, no, I don't want to. Mm -hmm. I don't want to rock your boat. I want to talk about. Course. I want to talk about Taylor Swift because she's trending. And yes, what are your thoughts on Taylor Swift? Do you listen to Taylor Swift? Um, I I don't. I have kids, and I even have you know young kids. I have young daughters. Um, I'm not aware of Taylor Swift music in terms of how it sounds. I'm aware of the content because it's always in the news that she, somebody breaks up with her and then she writes a song about them. Um, and I know she's hugely popular. She's beautiful. She has very, very long legs. Um, and, I, and she appears to be a very nice person. But I don't really know her music. It's just you, not, you know, it, she, she's not one of the Beatles. And so I'm sort of, you know, lost. She had a new music video come out. It's about, I think, 13, 13 minutes long of just yeah. one song. But then it would break, and there's dialogue, and there's things like that. But I understand what you're saying. I mean, not a yeah. lot of people, not a lot of people but, our age listen to Taylor right. Swift. Are we the same age, Willem, roughly? About, yeah, I think so. Yeah, I, I believe so. What is you're, that age? What is that age, Willem? Uh, well, what is I, that age? What, how old are you? <laughs> listen, I'm... <laughs> I'm not going to reveal my age okay. in this podcast, right. but I'm I will 64, say, Willem. Okay, but it's it's around there. Okay, it's around there. All right, good, good. Do you like gum? I like gum very much, but I don't chew a lot of gum. There's lots of things in my life I do like, but I don't get a lot of it. Um, I have a tendency to bite my tongue, but I love the flavor of gum, particularly juicy fruit. Why do you think you bite your tongue? Because it's in my mouth where the gum is. Or occasionally food. Okay, what would you say the ratio to biting the gum to biting your tongue? Excellent question. Well, whenever you bite your tongue, and I know I'm speaking to the, the, this universally, it's too often because you chew into it, 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 it. It's like you bit into steak. Even though I would say of my chews, let's estimate of chews, three meals a day, one, two, three, four, five, ten, twenty, probably 70 chews. So we're looking at in the neighborhood of a couple hundred bites a day, right? Right. I would say in a week, I bite my tongue once. So in about a thousand, one in a thousand. One in a thousand. Well, yeah. that's not really that bad. 
Especially if you just chew it really quick and get it out of your mouth real quick. Yeah, right. But you can't say that once you bite your tongue. It's 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 a horrible experience that is is one time too many. Well, this really is trying to relate to the gum. The gum is a chewing experience. Once the flavor is gone, which happens relatively quickly, I think you'll agree, particularly with a juicy fruit. Um, it's then just kind of chewing on, on putty mud, and it, you're really sort of tasting your spit. So at that point, I don't care much for the gum. So my process is, when I have a pack of gum, I'll chew it, minute and a half, spit it out, another one. Minute. I'll go through a pack of gum probably in about 15 minutes. Because you're chewing fast or because the gum is weak? Because I'm impatient, the gum goes turns to spit too quickly, and so I work through the gum. As a result, Willem, that's why I like gum, yes to your question, but I don't chew a lot of gum. It's more, even this explanation was more than it, it deserves. So I avoid the conflict of tongue, spit... But you're in a, you're a very engaged speaker, and I, this brings me to you running for Iowa. You're running for Congress in Iowa. Yes, yes. Tell me about that, and tell me what led to that. And well, and all that. Well, um, I lost. One of the great things about living in Iowa. You asked about Iowa. What's it like? Well, I lived in New York, Chicago, and L.A. most of my life, uh, except for the years that I grew up, and then I moved back here. Out of all those places, you can actually affect change here. You can run for this, that. People know you. You can get your arms around the community. So with that in mind, I'm a progressive. I felt that the state is slipping into some really arcane, um, antiquated uh, ideas of government. And so I thought I would run as a good progressive. I ran a good race, knocked on every door, and I lost. Because ultimately, it is a conservative place, and I was considered a socialist for, God knows, things like health care, education. Is it hard to move the needle? I mean, is it difficult? I mean, you just said it was. Is it? How hard is it to change Very centuries hard. of... Very hard. I think all change is incremental. All ch it's like leaning on the rudder of a great ship that you have the rudder of, of a small rowboat. And so you just have to lean on it a long time. The, the, the thing is not to get discouraged. I'm not discouraged, although I don't intend to run again. Uh, it's too expensive. But we need to keep bringing new blood into politics with the optimism that they can affect change. You know, uh, for every little step forward, you take a step back. I think the momentum of progress, progressive issues, does win the fight, ultimately. I think we are evolving toward a more open-minded species. Um, but it's in geologic time, so you don't really see the ice moving, but you know it is. And... Um, it can be very discouraging, because I don't know that in our lifetime, Willem, us being the same age as we are, um, that we're going to see, you know, seismic changes in in the way we live. What Except it, for inflation that's coming like the winter of Game of Thrones. It's coming like a two two shits in the winds. Yeah, yeah. I didn't know we it's, could say words like shits. Well, we... But yes, it's going you to just be, did. It's probably going to be edited out, to be honest with you. <laughs> It's just weird. I mean, one day you're walking around, alive, then yeah. just disappear. Eerie. Then one day you're dead. Yes, for, really for eerie. at least 13 billion years, right? What did it do for you? I mean, what kind of man are you? And what kind of man are you since you ran for Congress? <laughs> uh, what kind of man am I? Uh, you know what? I'm going to answer this very seriously. And I've answered all of these seriously. Maybe not the gum so much. Um, I am a man of conviction. I have five kids. Three, two are my own, three that I married. I <laughs> married into, rather. Um, and I care very much about the world that they're inheriting. I care very much about doing everything I can to give them the tools to have a more uh, opportunity, a cleaner environment, um, 
you know, and, and so I feel like, yeah, I'm doing my part because I'm a little louder than most, as, as the, your sound engineer can tell. Uh, I don't mind getting on the soapbox. I like the activity of trying to move people to action. And so I, I, I think I'm a good citizen. That's the answer to your question. And um, I want to talk about the um, U.S. pageant that you judged. Uh, you didn't judge. You hosted. You didn't you judge <laughs> you Miss America? Mrs. America? Is Mrs. It, America. Was it Mrs. America? So it's pregnant. Yes. I, I mean, I, I, not pregnant women, but it could be pregnant. Were, were any of the women pregnant? Well, well, they all could be, you know, at a certain point. But this, these were, I don't believe there were any pregnant women involved in Mrs. America. But yes, I, I hosted that a f- maybe about 18 years ago in Hawaii. And no one has ever brought that up since. So, Willem, my hat's off to you. Well, I'm, and I'm not done with the subject. Oh, okay. Tell me about just getting the call for that and compare that to getting the call for Saturday Night Live. <laughs> well, you know what? Saturday Night Live was like like we we talked about winning the lottery. This was not like winning the lottery, but here I was doing a game show on PAX. Now, there aren't a lot of actors out there going, ooh, I wish I had done a game show for PAX. All I ever wanted to do, Willem, yeah. and you, you can understand this, is work. I just want to work. I, want, I, I used to say anything but pornography, but even then, let me read the script, right? I, I'd like to think that what I'm doing is, is beneficial, and it feeds my family. But I just want to work. So I did a lot of game shows. One was with the now-defunct PAX Network, and they also produced the Mrs. America. So as a new PAX star back in the early 2000s, um, they asked if I would do Mrs. America, which wasn't that exciting except, oh, you'll be in Hawaii and we'll fly you and your wife out there, my ex-wife, actually. Um, and, um, And that was exciting. So yeah, it was it was uh, it was a three on the scale of seven. <laughs> oh, okay, but you weren't so you weren't married at the time. No, I was married. I'm I, I, I've been married many times. Uh, I'm on I'm on my third marriage. On my third marriage sounds like I'm going to my fourth. No, I'm done now. But I was with my second wife, who is the mother of my two boys. And, and so she was in the audience, and I sang something like Billy Joel's um, She's Always a Woman, you know, with tears in my eyes, beautiful, blah, blah, blah. Oh, look, the ex SNL comedian can actually sing, you know, yada, yada, yada. Um, but I think she left me soon after that, as I recall. Do you get nervous before you have to Never. speak? Or n- not at all? You don't, you do not, little, not even in not, the slightest. Is that true? Even for this? Yeah. 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 Um, I learned to not get nervous years ago because in high school I got nervous before plays. Um, but I learned two things. What are you nervous about? You're only nervous about making a mistake, forgetting your lines. Well, guess what? People do. You manage to get through it one way or the other. The audience rarely knows. And more importantly, the more every time I've made a fool of myself, the sun has managed to come up the same day. My friends are still my friends. Everything, my coffee is still, you know, hot. And so I realize it doesn't really make that much of a difference. It's worse to fear failure than it is to experience it. So I'm not nervous about anything. Tell me about your coffee. You just mentioned that you drink coffee. What do you put in your coffee? I put nothing in my coffee. And when asked to leave a little room for the cream, I say no. I like strong, dark coffee. I, I like dark coffee and strong coffee so much that I'll just tell them to pour it on my hand. <laughs> Doesn't surprise me in the least. Not in the least. I'm just joking. Is that part? Is, uh, I'm just of joking. Course. It's not serious. I'm just making a joke. I'm just trying hey, to be a little funny and mix it up. Well, and you are. Now, let, let's talk about you for a second, because you played Jesus Christ, for example. What? How does one prepare for Christ? I read, what, 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 you, you want to know what I did, honestly? I read the yeah. Bible backwards, and you did. I got 20 pages in, and what it does is it gives you a rear entry into the role of Jesus Christ. And, and when it comes to early Christians, understanding rear entry is very important. Well, it's not only a, a sin, it's also a virtue. But yeah, but what I did for that role was I, you know, I would, you know, like anyone, I would 
the first thing I did was before reading the Bible, I, I just put my feet in the dirt and just became closer to earth because uh -huh. that's sort of the journey is that we don't really know what this is or where we're going, but there are words to keep us together. And that was the message that I saw. And that's the message I went after. Actually quite profound and actually a little bit of a window in most of your characterizations, don't you think? Well, I mean, I mean, I can even see what you just described in clear and present danger. Well, in, if you watch the movie, there really is no clear and present danger. It's all metaphors. It's all backwards. And, you know, that's what movies do. I think movies and cinema particularly bring you in, take you out get you some cotton candy and you know and then drive you back home and in that particular movie remember the significance of coffee Ref wasn't it a coffee coffee factory where you came in it was trust me on this no, it was coffee it was coffee. a long time coffee ago loomed large. i don't remember I all the details <laughs> i know i know a any green goblin stories you want to share uh the only green goblin stories are coming out of my nose i'm a little <laughs> uh under the weather and have some mucus. We won't take this any further then, will we? That's 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 all I needed to know. Do you sunbathe? But I thought you were very good. Do you sunbathe? I, I do sunbathe. You know, again, okay, you asked for the differences. We, we Our sunbathing period is very short during the year. It's now very cold outside. I will not be sunbathing, but I, I like to sunbathe. I like a little cocoa color, you know? I'd like to take this white Caucasian skin and give it a little bit of a... Uh, Hint of mahogany, if you will. Who is who's who do you feel influenced you to become a comedian and an actor and a comic actor? What was it? Was it a series of things, or were there, or was there one person? It was for me. It was three people: Barney Fife, Don Knotts, of course, but the character of Barney Fife, Red Skelton, and me, God bless. And Dick Van Dyke. I wanted to embody all three of those uh, male comedic human characteristics of being a pathos, slapstick, um, insecurity. That to me, Charlie Chaplin, I, I, I look at all of them as the distant cousins of Charlie Chaplin. So for me, it is about the human condition as we experience pathos. And what was that? That's it? not a particularly funny answer, but... Well, it's it's something I wanted to explore, and I didn't think it was going to be particularly humorous. Explored like it was. There you go. Well, what was it about Dick Van Dyke? Because he was he seemed to be so goofy, yet so calculated, yet so on the money, yet so loose. What did uh, I you think like? You just, it was all of those things. You know, remember, and I was a little, little boy, so I don't even know if I'm remembering the first run or the reruns. It's hard to re recall. But, you know, they looked like the Kennedys. They looked like the, the uh, American family, small child, job, commuting, friends, neighbors, all of those things. He was trying to keep it together, move forward. But these circumstances that any of us could fall into, he had to deal with. And in his uniquely comedic, physical, slightly over-the-top style, it was funny. Because the people around him were sane, for the most part. And so he was trying to navigate this in his broad, um, you know, the, the Dick Van Dyke trips over the Ottoman. That's pretty much regular guy comes in the door, that happens. I mean, I know that's an abstract way to define it, but it, it, it's normal guy, hi everybody, trips over the Ottoman, catches his balance. That's sort of the concept of Dick Van Dyke. And it's really the type of comedy that goes through any tough period of time, the physical stuff, right? The physical yeah. comedy is the stuff that people go to after tragedy because it's easier to 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 dissolve on the palate. And, and, and the, what's the first joke we learn when we're in kindergarten? The first thing that makes the little girl laugh, falling down. You fall down. I remember falling down. This girl I liked laughed. And I thought, well, that's because we're not supposed to fall down. But I fell down. 
So there's a natural inclination to laugh at what's not supposed to happen. But that's slapstick in a way, you know? And in, in life, we fall down. And in life, we get... Yes, we, yes. Right, I mean, this is not just a physical comedy thing. And we actually fall down metaphorically, physically, spiritually. I mean, we talk about the, the year after Saturday Night Live. What was the year after Saturday Night Live? What was the growing period? And what was the resolution? I fell down. You did fall down, I, 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 but you didn't. Well, I, I fell down and I got back up. I mean, but you look, my my career was never what um, f- from winning the lottery from that moment. I've always had a career. I've always worked. I've done some really interesting things. Uh, one of those go- go- green goblins just now. You, just pull out I your just, nose. Just like I said, I'm I just saw something the, happen. I don't know if it's you allergies are. or what. Um, <laughs> But, you know, the dream is always to become Tom Hanks or Meryl Streep, you know, or Eddie Murphy. Um, and I never got there. So I made lots of choices that didn't go anywhere. I made I, there's lots of things that I've done that show up on, you know, the Lifetime Network. And I cringe when I see it. But every time I got an opportunity, I did the best I could. Tried to get another. Did the best I could. Tried to get another. Did the best I could. Well, you've done so many you know, different things. It seems like you've 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 gone all different ways in your life, and you're yes. still alive. So, I mean, you have you have gotten up, and you've walked around, and you've you've succeeded. Uh, that's the nicest thing that anybody could say, uh, and I thank you for that. I mean, you know, I have a history, and I'm not saying this to be self-deprecating. I have a history of losing. I didn't become a star. I didn't win Congress. Um, you know, I opened a restaurant, and it went under. But at the same time, I consider all of those efforts successes. You know, it's only over when it's over. So I look at life as a scrapbook. It's not a narrative. It's not a beginning and middle and end that people are going to read as a fairy tale or a fairy tale. It's it's a scrapbook. And you look at pictures and you remember moments. And that's my life. Gary Kroger for the hour. Like yours. And thank you for joining me. Do you have any social media that you want to plug? Willem, thank you. I do have a podcast called The Gary and Kenny Show, and it's on all the podcast platforms. The Gary and Kenny Show is has a YouTube channel. It's on DBNA TV, which is a streaming service, The Gary and Kenny Show. I also have a blog called Gary Has Issues, which is a political blog. The Gary and Kenny Show, we invite friends on. We'd love to have you, Willem. I'd love to be there. Love to have you, Willem. I'd love to be Because we like to talk to people in show business, producers, writers, actors, about how they... Uh, built their life and how they found success. And we try to make it funny. And I tried to make you at home on this podcast, even though it's... You did, Willem. You asked surprisingly deep questions and made me feel like a genuine guest. Well, you deserve that. And, you know, I'm not just treating you that way because it looks like you sunbathe. You look happy. Your cheeks... Oh, do do I look tan? Is that why you you asked the question? You look full of life. There's You almost could be pregnant yourself. You, You have a bit of a glow to you. I, Willem, I look forward. When, next time I see you in a film, I'm going to point up there and say, that's my friend. <laughs> and he asked me about gum. Gary Kroger for the hour. I'm Willem Defoe, and this is The Jeff Richard Show. For more of The Jeff Richard Show, <laughs> for more of The Jeff Richard Show, go to thejeffrichardshow.com. <laughs> i sniffle myself. And visit The Jeff Richard Show. And now a song from Meanest Man Contest.